Dagon lives in his own little lair of the abyss called Shadow Sea. I definitely envision it as very Marianas Trench style, dark, crushing pressure, a very oppressive, and so, so strange the way that we don't necessarily understand everything about our own ocean to the point where it feels very, very alien when you first encounter Dagon. There are all these different structures and and horrible demonic architecture and things that have been constructed. All these obelisks and pillars that have been built underwater. And at one point, you think that there's just another one of these massive structures in the distance until it shifts and moves. And you realize that this horrific gargantuan shape, this form coming towards you, is the shadow of Dagon himself. Hello and welcome to Making a Monster, the weekly podcast where game designers show us their favorite monster, how it works, why it works, and what it means. I'm Lucas Zellers. Today, for the first time on the show, and I'm certain not for the last, our monster comes from the cosmic horror genre, best known for the works of H.P. Lovecraft. This genre fills its universes with creatures and forces so titanic and incomprehensible, the best we can hope for is their apathy. I interviewed DM's Guild designer Alex Klippinger about one such creature just before the release of his collaborative monster book called Esmeralda's Encyclopedia of Evil. I'm like a shiny object person and like the new the newest thing that I'm working on is always the thing I'm most excited about. It's Oberith. Those are some good old kids from like third edition that I've updated for fifth edition. I'm just excited about them because they're really mean. They're just incredibly mean creatures and it's fun designing CR 23 creatures with horribly cruel abilities for killing high level characters. It's, it's always just a great time. It's funny. I, I can, I will design and sell high level player killing monsters all the time, but I've, I've killed like one, I've killed like three <laughs> ever. There were times where I was like, oh, is this too much? Do I need to pull some punches here? And then the longer I was running characters at tier three or higher, it's I, I need to make it harder, actually, because they're doing just too well. What incredibly mean, crazy things can I throw at them? Because I'm just going to sit back and watch them conquer it <laughs> every time, no matter what. It, they will always find a way to do it, which is, which is a rewarding experience in itself. I actually finished this monster design and all the stuff probably a good four or five months ago, but I keep just thinking about Dagon. People have probably traditionally heard that name associated with the cosmic horror entity. In fact, Dagon is one of the first cosmic horror entities, appearing in a short story of the same name by H.P. Lovecraft, first published in the November 1919 issue of The Vagrant. What is it about that genre that appeals to you? I just, I like the approach and the tone a lot of times. One angle for horror is investigative, where we as readers are asked to go along with the protagonist, go along with the storyteller, and have these horrors or these terrible things revealed to us. And we usually do that kind of hand in hand with the voice of the protagonist. They are also experiencing these horrible revelations and things like that. And I think cosmic horror really enjoys leaning into that. When horror does that sort of flip from what's going on to, oh my God, this is what's going on. I feel like it flips a lot harder with cosmic horror because it's not just, oh my gosh, this person is a murderer. It's a stripping away a very basic understanding of reality and things beyond time and space and things that are beyond our comprehension, beyond description. So it, it really does that flip in a much more dramatic fashion than other horror genres, even other horror genres that engage with the supernatural. Do you know where, how Dagon got from where he started into Dungeons and Dragons? It's actually uh, translated over in Monster Manual 2. That's like first edition Dungeons and Dragons. There's a lot of legacy monsters today. I mean, Fomorians and everything are, are from world mythologies. And I think with each subsequent edition, they've become more Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Where they, okay, okay, we're going to pull them a little bit further away each time from the myth that they came from or the, the real world, world origin and root them more and more firmly into 
yeah but it might have share the same name or have the same concept but like this is a D, &D creature we want you to feel like it's not just ripped from the page of some other book or some other mythology there are aberrations and cosmic horror entities in D, &D and they exist in the far realm you would think if they wanted to firmly keep it as a kind of lovecraftian creature they would they would do a far realm thing but i think they made a very conscious decision to pull dagon out of that context and into something completely different to make it a sort of D, &D creature <laughs> dagon is often presented in art as this long sinuous sort of eel-like creature but it has limbs with clawed with these massive clawed fingers it gives it a very distinct sense of being an aquatic creature but not necessarily obeying the laws that we normally associate with it like having almost humanoid like limbs that clearly aren't meant for swimming these mini bulbous eyes are sort of embedded into the sides of its head and of course you have to have the jaws element of the massive gaping maw the moment where the light hits part of Dagon just right or glimmers off of, off of its eyes and this horrible realization of, oh, that's, that's him. Like that is real. This, the kind of moment where it's, and God, I hate to say it, that's no moon, <laughs> you know, but like the, the very moment where it's like, oh no, that's, that's real. You may remember from our episode on the Warforged Colossus that most high-tier monsters in D&D &D have regional effects impacting the terrain around them, layer actions occurring at intervals during the fight, and special legendary actions they can take after a player's turn. First, I guess the most important one, regional effects. Spells and other magical effects that allow a creature to breathe water do not function within Dagon's lair unless it allows them to. So at any point, Dagon's just like that. No, you don't just get to breathe underwater, which is, yeah, that's a lot. And then its, it's lair actions have things like uh, whirlpool surrounds Dagon, uh, creatures spend extra movement while swimming, which is already a thing that if you don't have something that allows you to swim, it, it's already extra movement. So instead of moving 30 feet, you're moving, essentially you're moving to 10, which can be incredibly crushing in a fight. Lair action, a shockwave ripples from Dagon throughout the lair. Each creature holding its breath must succeed on a DC 23 constitution saving throw or have the air forced from its lungs, which is very, very mean. And yeah, it's very mean. And just, it, it, oh, yeah. For Dagon, Alex also used the madness mechanic found in D&D's 2018 accessory volume, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. There, madness is a special condition characters in the presence of a demon lord must resist. Each one was unique to the specific demon lord it was referring to. And I did the same thing here. And it has a lot to do with, guess what? Drowning, because you're in an, a plane of the abyss that is just a horrible, deep, dark ocean. The, the way the madness tables work is they're like character statements in first person. And one of them is, I don't feel sane unless I'm immersed in water which can have very, very nasty role play meets mechanics effects for someone. And none of those things are even things that damage a player. And none of them are even part of the actual stat block. And then one more fun little aquatic specific thing. When Dagon is in a body of water, it knows the precise location of any creature within 120 feet of it that is in the same body of water. So no, you cannot hide from Dagon. You are in Dagon's domain. He is a aquatic demigod level creature like he knows where you are so yep yep that's this is all the fun mean stuff that i come up with <laughs> for high level creatures i think the goal that i had once i lit on the idea of oh i want to play with drowning rules nobody really thinks about drowning or suffocation rules in 5e there's a lot of little corners of of the rule set that people don't really have to think about or engage with very often. How long a character can hold their breath. I'm thinking about swimming. And so I thought, how can I make, how can I specifically make this water-based creature challenge players in a way that asks them to think about 
rules and challenges completely separate from their hit points. Because if you run out of air in the rules, you hit zero hit points and you start rolling death saving throws. You could have a thousand hit points. It doesn't matter if you cannot figure out how to solve the problem of how to breathe underwater or like how to outsmart the, the sort of effects that otherwise would prevent you from breathing underwater. None of your hit points, none of your stats mean anything. And I think the solution to that, ideally in a campaign where Dagon is featured as like either the main villain or just a villain in general, players could ideally ignore half the stuff that I've done here because a DM has broadcast these dangers to them and like they've engaged with the mechanics of researching Dagon or like finding out the secret. I think all the things about knowing is half the battle is accentuated with very, very high level monsters, more, even more so than, than lower level creatures. This is a, a way for DMs to say, okay, I'm going to challenge you in a way that you have probably never been challenged before with rules that you never really necessarily thought of before. And, and I don't, you know, the, the mean way to do this is, oh, huh, you, you show up in a, a watery area, you fight Dagon, you die, which is not how I want a creature like this to be run as a creator or as a DM. I want the dangers and the existence of this thing to be broadcast. I think a lot of teams will get a lot of pleasure out of presenting this problem and just sitting back for 30 minutes and crossing your arms and smiling while players are just trying to figure out how do we deal with this? How do we even engage with this before initiative is even rolled? My guest is Alex, not as bloodthirsty as you think, Clippinger, who updated D&D renditions of Lovecraftian Eldritch Horrors for 5th edition. You can find Dagon and 35 other challenging creatures in the collaborative monster book Esmeralda's Encyclopedia of Evil. If your adventuring party is unfortunate enough to have to bring down a creature like Dagon, you might want to fight dirty and go for its bulbous, glistening eyes. And you can do that with Alex's monster supplement, Go for the Eyes, which provides monster-specific rules for players to inhibit or cripple a creature mid-battle. It's an innovative way to make combat more than just roll-to-hit, roll-for damage, and Alex has made a copy available for free to the first 250 listeners to claim them at scintilla.studio slash monster. That's S-C-I-N-T-I-L-L-A dot studio slash monster. Link is in the show notes. Thanks for listening to Making a Monster. If you like what you've heard and you want to support the show, please share it with the people you play games with. Your recommendation will go a long way toward helping people trust me with their time and attention, and it's a real gift to me and the creators I feature. You can also make the show better by supporting me on Ko-Fi. Ko-Fi? Coffee. It's a digital tip jar that supports the show directly, and it will help me do things like license music for the show. When you do, you'll get sneak peeks of upcoming episodes and the sense of camaraderie and partnership usually reserved only for adventuring parties. You'll find all those links in the show notes or at scintilla.studio slash monster. I'll see you next week.